who are you? And I, I think of uh, that being a lifelong journey of learning who I am and response to the environment in which I live. And so I'm, I'm a product of my environment first and foremost. And um, I'm a man in an age where we have many, many generations behind me. This, you know, I feel like I'm the, like all of us here, we're the, we're the sum of all that's ever been in our family lines. And so I have all these people behind me who are no longer here on the earth, but they're a part of me and they're a part of who I am. And they're, I think, helping me. And in some, they're still grieving their journey. Like all of our ancestors, I think now we can safely say in the world that, you know, we all have ancestors who have experienced a, a separation from their indigenous connection to land. And we have that in the landscape, in, in our ancestral landscape. And we also have the experience of generations upon generations, thousands and thousands of years of being intact with the landscape. And I have that all right behind me, just behind this little vest here. It's all a part of who I am today. And some I'm conscious of and others I'm not. And I'm expressing that part of my journey with the landscapes in which I live and the social scapes in which I'm surrounded within. And, and that's a, that's a journey of becoming fully human, I think, is, is uh, trying to bring all of those places together in an intersection that's life-giving and has grace and fun. And at times it's really hard, but you get through it and you grieve. And it's like that, it's like, for me, life is this, it's like heaven is on earth. And it's experiencing all the ups and downs, but doing it with other loving people, doing it with other people who um, appreciate that I'm imperfect and, and, and at times I'm perfect for who I am. And I'm this blend of all these things. And, and I love that part of life. And that is a big part of who I am. I, I, uh, it's a hard question to answer. It's a really hard question to answer because it's there's the part I can see in myself, there's the part I intuit, and there's the part that is just underlying. And um, yeah. I'm part nature, I'm part wild nature, I'm part domesticated man. Um, and it leads me to what I'm doing in the world. As all these things make up that that kind of foment of 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 nutrition that feeds something that becomes your life, and I love the the expressions of what I do in the world are so varied. Like I get up every day, and it's such a different day than the day before. Like here I am. I'm in Germany. I'm under a beech tree that's gosh, I don't even know how old, but I'm like 20 meters up in the tree, in a tree house with the voices of people all over on the grass on a rare sunny day here in uh, this part of Southern Germany, doing design work and designing their landscapes. And I'm a part of that journey with them. And together we've created this, this, um, this journey in bringing natural patterns back into how we live in a modern day, in the cities, in our lives, in our houses. How do we bring the patterns of nature in? And there's all this happening today. And I'm sitting and surrounded by this beautiful natural part of the world, this, this tree fort and the voices and the crickets in the background. And today is unlike any other day I've ever lived, not even close to a day I've lived. And and so that for me is like this amazing part of what I do is I, I, I have the opportunity to be invited to different places around the world to teach, to facilitate 
um, to learn, to design landscapes, to work with other people who are designing landscapes, to make offerings in the world, to, to sing to the lakes, to, to acknowledge life wherever I can acknowledge her, and to help life live, you know, and that's, it's not, I, I always, I love to share with young people, I haven't had a job in 25 years, and I, you know, I work 12 to 14 hours a day, so I don't have to work eight hours for someone else doing something that isn't my gift, and, um, and so that expresses itself in a lot of ways. I'm a farmer, um, I'm a writer, I'm a storyteller at the core. Um, my gifts uh, are constantly evolving as I age as well. And it's a part of that working around the cycles of life as a man where my gifts get a different level of maturity and relevance for where I am in that journey. And so I'm in a journey where I'm in my 50s and um, I'm moving away from being a man who is a chief in his village, is a, is a leader in his village, to being more of a teacher and a writer and a storyteller who's whispering in the ears of the chiefs and where I'm stepping back from that place and carrying such a load. And it's a, it's a time where I'm kind of grieving that part of my life because I'm stepping into another role that's needed in my community and in the communities that I'm connected with through the Nature Connection movement. And it's, um, and it's something where I don't have an intact culture around me guiding me in that. There are people who have remnants of it of intactness in their cultures and there's remnants that have helped and I almost feel like we're in a time where we're we're doing things in sort of triage. Do you know the word triage? Do you? What is triage? So triage is like, you know, you can be in your health and you're eating well and you're taking care of your well-being and you're, you're getting the right amount of rest, you're eating good nutrition on a balanced way, drinking water at the right time, so you're, you're nurturing through time your health. But then you get, uh, you know, you fall out of a tree house. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you get, you know, you trip and fall and you like hurt your arm. And all of a sudden now you have to do some things to help that like in the moment really quickly to keep things from your health right there in that moment. And it's, that's called triage. And it's where you're, you're having to just kind of get in there and take care of the things so you don't die and you don't have further injury. And I feel like culturally we're kind of in that place right now where a lot of what we're doing is triage to keep some of it alive, but it's still not in its intactness where cultures are actually emerging from landscapes because I believe that culture comes from land and our relationship to her as a group of people. So imagine in this area, we, we are a group of people in these valleys next to Lake Constance here in southern Germany and we are getting all that we need to sustain us in an honorable way. And we have an honorable relationship with our food, our shelter, our clothing, our water sources, our, um, our fire and our energy. Through time, the landscape would express herself through us as culture that's unique to this place. It'd be very different than where I'm from, which is Santa Barbara, California. I'm in that area, that region. And the culture there is very different because the landscape's different, the climate's different. And so in this time, we're, we're trying to hold, I believe, a lot of culture, uh, cultural aspects or remnants that don't have its root, their root in the land any longer. And so I call it triage because we're just trying to keep it alive enough to where we can recognize it as it starts to come through us as we grow our relationship with the land. And I, I feel like I know that we're kind of I'm jumping amongst questions, but um, it's hard to not do that. You know, it's uh, but but I feel like the nature connection movement, this idea of oh, I don't even like calling it nature connection 
our nature awareness of our connections because we are never disconnected from nature. We're always connected to her. You can't get out of it. You're not free from nature. Nature supplies everything you need, the breath that you're breathing every moment, the water that makes up most of your body. It, she provides all of the sustenance that, that you need, regardless of whether you acknowledge that or not. You might live in a city, you might live somewhere where you're not in touch with your sustenance, but you are intricately, completely and totally within that web of life and you can't get out of it even if you choose to. You're not free from the web of life. And so here it is where the nature awareness movement is helping us to understand our connections through awareness. Because the more we can understand those connections, the better we can design our life to actually be life-giving within that web of life. And for me, a big motivator of merging and creating a place of intersection between the nature awareness movement and the permaculture movement is that people who are growing their awareness of how to observe in nature and how to be observed in nature, by nature, I think there it goes both ways that those people make really good designers because they can see the subtle patterns that are in a landscape. And that when you can see those subtle patterns in a landscape, you can better design with them so they use less energy to be able to produce the things we need to live as humans. And it's what our ancestors have always done. It's a, it's, they, they've been keen observers of the natural environment in which they derive all of their sustenance. And they work with that to maintain it. Because if we continue to draw up and out more resources than what's replenished, then we're truly stealing from our grandchildren. And I honestly, I don't think anybody would truly, could truly say deep down in their heart that that's okay for them that they would steal from their grandchildren. And I feel like there's desire for change right now, but a lot of people don't know what to do. They're feeling helpless. And that's my experience in the world right now. As I go around and I hear how people are losing hope with collapsing ecologies and social systems and economies, political systems that are that are oppressive and all of these things. It's like, what can I do? You know, corporations are taking over. There's like all of these things going on, but I, I just don't look at it like that. I look at it as that's, those are design systems that can't be sustained. They just can't be sustained. They're design systems that will soon be obsolete either by choice, by us consciously designing something that make them obsolete, or it's, going to happen through ecological crisis and social crisis, I believe. And I don't think there's a way out of it because we can see that those systems are drawing more calories of energy than they're actually helping to, re to, to replenish. And from a caloric level, a caloric level, scientifically, that can only be maintained for so long. And how we work with sunlight becomes crucial culturally. And so this whole idea of permaculture is about designing with sunlight, designing with natural patterns. And, and the nature awareness movement are starting to produce some of the best designers. And that leads back to who I am because that's a big part of my background. And I've had, uh, yeah, just a, the fortune of being able to be mentored by some amazing uh, naturalists in the world, um, trackers, um, wildlife biologists, um, and many elders who have all those skills and many others, including cultural skills. So I've been very fortunate in my life to have that. And so that's a, that's a part of who I am today is the collective of all the different people who have offered me a learning opportunity and so that's a part of who you know who sits here today is that collection of that that I don't know it's like a it's like I live in the memory 
I am the memory of all of these different interactions that I've had in my life, just thousands and thousands and thousands of interactions, including this one right now. And I'm, I am the memory of those, expressing myself to the next step, the next memory, and trying to link those memories together. And, and, and in a time in my life where I'm also trying to find out more of the memory behind my life, that make up all of my ancestry, so I know better how to step forward in an equitable way. What were the key experiences and teachers in your life? Mm. Wow. You know, when you think back of who are your teachers in your life, it's like, it's, you know, it could be the teacher that you didn't like in school, you know, that taught you something about who you are. And, um, but I look back and I think of uh, my great grandma Grant as one of my first where as a baby she would watch me when my parents were at work and some of my earliest memories are this, this woman who was born in the 1870s caring for me in her house in Pasadena where she had this big garden out back and chickens and just this this woman who was very much in touch with what sustained her, which is a big, uh, a big part of a big pattern in my life that started when I was just a young one. And so, of course, my parents, you know, I have such amazing parents um, and a lot of learning that has come from them that's been both, you know, why are they my parents? You know, you know, when you're younger and you're like, ah, my parents. And then you're like, later you're like, oh, my parents, you know, it's, it's, you know, some of us have that. And I, uh, I cherish my family because there was love and with love, I think there's health. And I, I find that it's, um, you can see the tracks of kids in the work that I've done over the years with youth that where love wasn't there. And you can see it in who they are. Their worldview carries it. Their actions carry that. And yet, some transform the lack of love into being incredible lovers and, and nurturers. You know, it's all what we do with what we learn and, and with our teachers, you know. We should be able to learn from anybody in any situation. It brings me to one of my teachers, uh, in my life, Tom Brown Jr. Uh, was a very formidable teacher in my life, and he would he brought up this concept of asking the sacred question, and and you might be thinking, well, what's that? <laughs> what's a sacred question? And I love things that are sacred to me are not big things, but they're really powerful things in small packages and almost remain hidden. And you have to be in a certain space and have a certain awareness and a certain kind of shape to your soul to be able to interact with it. And this particular question is so simple and so accessible, and yet it leads us down the journey of inquisitive learning. And it's asking all the different elements you come into in your life and you face or situations you face, it's asking that question, what is this telling me? What do I have to learn from it? And just really diving into that. And for me, I've added another question to it. So it's a triple, not a double. I'm, I'm really into not having binary solutions, but actually giving it the stability of the triad. And what I add is then, what is its food? What can I do to feed it? How can I feed this? So what is this telling me? What do I have to learn from it? And how can I feed it? And, and in a way where it's life-giving. So if it's a negative situation, how could I feed this situation so that it can become something that gives life? How can a problem become a solution? How come something so touching in my life can actually help me to shape my patterns of who I am so that I can help to, 
to give life through that kind of inspiration. So my teachers have been many, and, uh, um, but there's been those formidable ones through time. My wife, oh, my dear, sweet Cynthia, um, she is one of my biggest teachers. And I think in a lot of ways for all of us, those people that we have intimacy with, and now we're, you know, coming up on 28 years uh, this September that, you know, you, you, through time they become a mirror, this reflection to you of your growth. And my wife has just been such a patient teacher for me and such a, uh, such a balance point for me so I can see things in balance. One of our teachers from New Zealand, uh, a man named Barry Brailsford, um, he shares with us about the ancient peoples of New Zealand. And one of the qualities that they have about learning is that you learn in the male-female balance. So even if you're going to learn a very important teaching that you don't come as just a male or just a female, but they would have you come as a male and a female together. Even if you weren't married, you would come with another balance point so that the teachings were always shared in the presence of the balance of the feminine and the male. Now, I also think we can balance some of that in ourselves as well. I think that teaches us that. But when we ha heard that from him, um, we realized that we needed to do a lot of the learning together in our life. And so we've really made a conscious effort to work with teachers together as a couple and go through some of those big life journeys together. So, yeah, in so many ways, we're just, um, she is one of my most significant teachers and most, uh, yeah, just a cherished teacher. Um, oh, and there's just been so many influences. There's elders that I've hardly known, but have asked the right question at the right time that have sent me on journeys that have changed my life, and yet then I don't see them again. There's been people I've just met randomly, supposedly, or synchronistically, people I've met synchronistically, who we just pass for a moment and something's exchanged and that's influenced me. But I find that I've had the people that I've worked the longest with or I've been committed with, like I work with a teacher named Martin Prechtel and, and he's, uh, for 14 years, my wife and I have been learning from him and it's been some of the most influential learning journeys I've ever been on and journeys especially around culture and how to root culture in the ground and how to be a vessel of culture from the ground. Um, Oh, so many, so many. Um, I find like right now um, I've had the fortune of working with CircleWise and with Elka and I'm learning so much from Elka right now about cultural engineering. And I've had the fortune of working with John Young in the past and a lot of the elders and teachers in that group. And Elka is someone who uh, contacted me a couple of years ago and was doing this incredible project of bringing in cultural engineering into a GIZ uh, gathering with uh, other people who were helping with that. And, um, and it was the time we first met, but we had common experiences through John Young and the Eight Shields movement and, um, and other connections with other people. It's, it's very, very interesting, the, the amount of connections. And since then, I've been really, um, really interested in how the nature connection movement can blend with the permaculture movement. And Elka has been a really wonderful teacher in bringing in the social permaculture piece, even though she doesn't call it that. And she's calling it the eight shields. Uh, you know, she's, I'm sure there's other things you call it, Elka, but um, you're right there. Elka's right there. <laughs> Over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but calling it the eight shields, uh, cultural basket, basically. And what I find is that's the part that's missing the most in the permaculture movement. 
And so for me, I'm here also as a student learning more how to integrate that into the work that I do teaching permaculture courses around the world and working and doing other things that aren't permaculture, but they have permaculture infused into them. So things like working with USAID, doing trainings through their Food for Peace programs and putting this kind of invisible structures in place so that the things that they're learning about landscape design are also infused with social integrity with landscapes and social integrity within the connections that people make because we know that just having good design on the ground doesn't mean that it's going to maintain itself and be sustainable. It takes also having a culture that's linked to that place and that has a cultural basket that's authentic um, in, in how it holds the people and how the people can express themselves in, in their natural patterns as a human being. Every animal has a culture that's related to its place and its, its, its experiences. And so we're just in a time where we no longer are deriving our culture from a landscape and an intactness to a landscape, but we're deriving our, our worldviews and our actions from, um, I don't know, I like, I, I seem to look, think to look at it as, as being people in flight away from that. And, and so, Creating a cultural basket that is rooted in cultures when they're intact with the landscape helps people to create the muscle memory and the social memory and the ancestral memories to start to understand how to again connect deeply with being the expression of culture from place. I don't know if that's making sense, but it's there's a depth to this that the permaculture movement needs. And I think that the permaculture movement as a design science has something to offer the nature awareness movement who are people who have this deep connection with place but aren't often understanding how to translate those skills as a naturalist into designing how they live day to day at home. And I think it's this beautiful blend and, and so Elka is definitely a teacher in that landscape as well for me. And. Uh, I, ha I find, um, oh, I mean, we could just talk till Saturday or Sunday about teachers because there's just many. And climbing the ladder up this to this treehouse was a pretty good teacher as well, you know? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, having to deal with that fear and like the, the wobbly legs, you know? It's like situations become teachers too. My sit spot is an elder and my sit spots that I've had at different places in my life have been elders to me and the beings that are there. I had this one manzanita tree and I don't know if you know the manzanita. It's a, it's a drier chaparral. It's a tree that here you wouldn't call it a tree. It would be like a hardy bush, but where I'm from, it's a tree and it's this beautiful red bark, incredible. Um, you know, it might only be like, you know, three meters tall, but it's like 60, 70, 80 years old or 100 years old at, you know, not so high. And these trees are so rooted in the landscape and they're so hardy above ground. And I remember sitting with this manzanita at my sit spot and just hearing the voice of experience by just observing the manzanita tree and realizing that there are so many different ways to hear language. And here the tree the, the, was speaking to me in ways where the heat of the day would change and bark would start to peel as the season changed and the heat of the day changed. You would start to hear the cracking of the, the bark peeling in that. And, and I realized that's a voice and it's teaching me about understanding my landscape. It's teaching me about also shedding and understanding like I have a part of my life where there are things that I need to go through cycles in my life and shed and that that's a natural pattern is shedding and then growing out a new part of yourself and I'm like I'm hearing this from the trees cracking of its skin falling off and then this new beautiful part of itself 
goes through this, this whole other cycle of growth until it cracks off. And I realize my life is like that too. I have times where I go through that and so many other teachings. So I also believe a lot of my elders are not human. And like a lot of my ancestors who believe their ancestors aren't just human either. Where you have an ancestral line of humans, but then you might have, if you're a Marvingian in France, that you have uh, a whale and a honeybee are also your ancestors. And so I, I feel like that with elders. I feel like the elders are all around us. And right now, the real intact elders with landscapes are not human. A very few of those intact elders with landscapes. There are some around the world, but I'm finding most of them are actually other beings. And they can teach us about how to be culturally appropriate where we live, in the landscapes in which we dwell, that if we listen in the right languages and start to understand through our awareness that we're being spoken to all the time and that we actually can speak back in a lot of ways. And just like the elders that I have in my life where I make a gift for, for teaching me and thanking me, I thanking them for all they're giving, I do the same with the tree. Give offerings to the tree and say thank you just going down the track so, yeah I don't know how else to answer what is permaculture <laughs> permaculture uh, what is permaculture permaculture to me is a design science for regenerative human settlement it's a a methodology of working with natural patterns. So looking at when you're designing human settlements. And when I say that, it's not about going into natural environments and ripping it apart to do permaculture, but it's about going into damaged landscapes and creating regenerative human systems for food, energy, housing, so, social interaction, um, water systems, um, reducing the erosion and converting that erosion to life-giving systems that also support the ecologies that are surrounding that system and a part of that system. So it's a, it's a design framework that honors indigenous uh, design and combines it with appropriate science and technologies in a way that works with natural patterns to create systems that don't detract from the world, but actually give to the world. And also feed people and help us to live more equitably in our landscape. If I have one floor on an elevator going up and I'm with somebody on an elevator, and I only have one floor with them, I'll just say, you know, I'll push the button, the door will close. Shh. Permaculture is a design science for regenerative human settlement. Ding, the second. And then if I have more time, I add in the layers of that we're harmonizing with nature and we're working with damaged landscapes to heal them. And I could keep going up, maybe a huge skyscraper. I could keep going up, except I don't want to use the image of a skyscraper because mostly we're not designing big buildings. But the idea of, it's a tool that is taking what, here it is, we have this unique brain, these humans, very unique brain. We have a unique set of sensory perceptions. We have opposable thumbs that can do amazing things. And those tools, I believe, are the tools that are the gift of our species to steward the land so that it enhances natural processes. When you look at many, many evidences around the world. Um, I love, there's a book called Tending the Wild from California. You can see that people were a part of the stewardship of a landscape. 
where when the people were removed from the landscape, that the landscape actually started to lose some of its biodiversity. It started to lose some of its vitality without the people there in this part of the world where it, they were cultivating the wild even to be as healthy as it could be. It's not saying that you go into a forest where people are not there, that it's not healthy and vibrant, but we've seen evidence over and over again in different parts of the world that we have the capacity to help let more light into a forest and to do, to do different tending and caretaking tasks with these tools of who we are to actually bring even more abundance and vitality. And I believe that permaculture... Oh, let me back that up. And I believe with those skills, as with anything, we can either make it a tool or a weapon. And so with the same set of skills as a steward, we can also rip apart a forest. We could denude everything that is happening in a healthy ecology and bring it down to uh, a completely damaged landscape. With the same set of posable thumbs, a sent our sensory awareness, our brains, Permaculture to me is a tool for us to move back to being the steward of a landscape. Combine that with nature awareness because the best designers are the ones that can observe the subtle patterns of nature. I just find that over and over again, the best designers are people who can track in the landscape the subtle patterns and how they blend, how they move, where they're going to connect. Um, and it's it's just in time. We're at a time where, you know, we're one of the, we're within these few generations in all of human history that have ever had the opportunity to make the choice whether humanity and many other species will be able to continue. That's never been in our history. We've never had that extension of our biological power into a landscape to actually be able to stop humanity in its tracks, which means many other species will be stopped in their tracks as well, as we're seeing now. We have this, it's, it's unbelievably huge responsibility right now to make the right choice. And for me, the choice is life. If humans are gone, nature's going to heal herself. It's not up to us whether nature survives. Nature will go on beyond us. That's what she does. She's, she's so much more well equipped than we are. And for healing. And she does it whether we choose to or not. And so we're at a place where we need to shift how we as humans are interacting with the landscape. And working with nature's healing mechanisms to speed up the healing. And and that's what we're doing here right now. That's what I think Elka and CircleWise is doing. They're doing it from their cultural basket is getting, I mean, you, how can you design for healing if you can't see the healing processes in nature? So it's like we need to work together. It's a time of coming together in these really crucial generations. I would be I, my soul would be heartbroken if I didn't give all my energy to that. To leave my granddaughter with a choice that's already made and there's no future. And we're right there. You know, we're right there. It's so scary to think of that. You know, it's like, you know, when you look, because I, I read so many like scientific journals and things like I, it's weird, this weird side of me where I, I, I that was my training. And, and I, I just like, I'm reading it. I'm like, uh oh, like, I mean, it's really serious. And it's like, this is our time to do this. This is not like, it's not a choice. You know, we don't have a choice about this. Like we you know, I just said choosing, but it's like, we don't have a choice if it's going to happen or not. You know, it's like, it's, it's happening. And so our choice is how are we going to respond? 
how are we responding? How are we moving? And I think that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think why a lot of us are, I mean, that's why people pay to come and learn about designing for their lives and for the, the land around them is there, we feel it now. Like you feel it in the land. You feel it in the people. Yeah. What is the wheel of life and how is it related to permaculture design? Mm. I think it's so interesting. You can go to you can go to caves all over the world and different cultures that were around those caves and you'll find common symbols and Uh, one is this circular symbol um, with many names that for me has been something that I wasn't raised in a society that had an acknowledgement of some of these symbols that you find in common around the world. And one of them is like this, this circular pattern With a, with a cross through it, you know, but it's not a cross. I don't want to use that word with an, uh, with, with two intersecting lines through it. And you see that over and over. You see it in the Anasazi, you see it in, um, in the mountains of the Caucasus, the, there's old cave paintings. I was in Zimbabwe looking at caves, um, just last year and there's that same symbol and I'm like, what is that? And when you start to talk to cultures that still have a remnant connection to landscape or people who are from cultures who still have some remnant memory of their connection to the landscape, you start to realize that it's a, it's a symbol of a reoccurring pattern in nature that is within us and without, you know, all around us. And it can, it can be, this, this symbol can be a, represent the cycle of the sun. It can represent the cycle of the seasons. And it represents the cycle of growth. You know, in a tree, this circular spiraling that happens. And when you see a two-dimensional symbol like that, like the, some people call the wheel of life, the medicine wheel, um, the circle of life, that it's a two-dimensional representation of a growth spiral. And so you look at the base few patterns that make up all of life, and one of them is the spiral of growth. So you have an expanding universe moving in a spiral. You have the, the way that water moves through a landscape is a spiral. You have the, uh, the movement of how we, we make our way around the sun is a spiral. We have the, um, the way that a tree grows is a spiral. Our spines grow in a spiral. A mushroom grows in a spiral. The, the big learning for me has been to understand how those physical traits in the world play out in who I am as a human being. Realizing that culture grows in a spiral. Realizing that I learn in a spiral. And for me, it is a understanding of a natural pattern you can't step outside of. But when you push against it, it costs you energy. So for me, it's a, it's a, it's a map of energy efficiency. Because it's telling us there's these patterns that are happening that, you know, you can't deny the spiral and its effect in the world and how, you know, the sunflower grows in a spiral and the, um, like Fibonacci had uh, discovered the spiral in the breeding pattern of rabbits and it's like over and over the spiral, the spiral, the spiral. And so you realize that this pattern, if you push against it, it's going to cost energy. And so much of design right now 
in human systems is pushing against these natural, subtle natural patterns and not so subtle natural patterns. And for me, that wheel of life is a map in how to be energy efficient. So if I'm working with a group of kids and running a wilderness program, which is a, one of the things that my wife and I have uh, in the mid 90s started a wilderness program in Santa Barbara called Wilderness Youth Project. And we learned that kids follow a spiral of learning that actually mimics the growth of plants and the growth of, um, you know, growth of us as humans, that there's a, a pattern in this wheel of life that's also the sun, that's also the moon, it's also seasons. And that in the learning journey, if we could work with that pattern, that it took less energy with the kids. Like I had just more energy at the end of the day by working with the natural pattern of the wheel with them. And it's something that I'm not gonna go into all the depth of it right here, but it's something that you're finding in a lot of nature awareness groups around the world are utilizing this, uh, it's, it's often referred to as the eight shields model, but like in the Tutu Hill Mayan and other cultures, they'll have, rather than eight directions in their wheel, they'll have 260 directions, all with attributes that relate to a spiral of growth that you find in nature. And so for me, it's practical. It's a practical tool. And also because it's so practical and life-giving, to me, that starts to get into this place of sacred. So you find that um, the wheel could also be a part of a, a ceremonial feeding of the landscape because it's representing something that gives life. And so it's like there's this practical part that I'm using in program design and curriculum development and in design on landscapes for food systems. And then there's this part of it that's also the recognizing that because it's so much a part of all of life that it's actually a sacred part of life and that it's something that uh, should be honored as such and so it's it's this interesting interesting isn't a good word it's a very powerful awareness of the world encapsulated into a symbol that's like a seed it's like the wheel of life is a seed. And when you have the culture around it to explain it and to make it relevant to the world around you and the world within you, all of a sudden you see the symbol and you can see the potential of what that is. You actually see the story of it and it hydrates into this very big thing that, I mean, it's one of the biggest understandings I think we could have. It's we're surrounded in it in the universe and yet the symbol is a seed. And so for me, it's, a, it's like, how do we, as facilitators and elders and um, change makers, how do, we, how do we help that seed? How do we create the germination conditions for that seed to sprout in people? And I think there's a lot of, I'm so grateful for the teachings at Wilderness Awareness School, um, teachings of John Young, um, Paul Raphael, Ingwe, Jake Swamp, um, all the different elders who have been a part of Wilderness Awareness School and the Eight Shields teachings, uh, Gilbert Walking Bull, uh, Tony Tenfingers. I mean, there's all these amazing elders and new ones coming now who have helped the seed have some germination conditions so that it's growing inside of people so we have this understanding. And then we can take that understanding and bring it right back into the seed as a symbol. And then when you see it on the ground, you can like, ooh, you know, it has a lot of meaning. Where before, if I looked in the cave and I saw the symbol and I didn't have the cultural relevance and the personal relevance and the natural relevance in me, it just was a is a drawing and that's where I think it's important in these times is that we 
We give life to symbols and the symbols give life back to us if they're authentic like that. Yeah. What is your vision for healthy and regenerative culture? Hmm. You know, I, in, in asking the question of what is my vision for a healthy and regenerative culture, I would have to say that it's that culture is unique to landscape, the landscape in which the people who are asking the question about. So I, I couldn't say that there's a overarching vision for every culture in the world or that there would be only one culture. I love in the many cultures around the world that they talk about how when we lose our diversity, that it's the end of the world in a negative way. When we actually get to oneness is when the world's destroyed. Now, I know there's a lot of people who talk about oneness, but what I see that is, is that it's a, a connectivity of our diversity. And so this idea of diversity being directly related to life. So the, the more beneficial diversity and more beneficial diverse connections we have, the more stable life is. So culturally, I think it's important that there's thousands upon thousands and thousands of cultures around the world that are expressing the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of different local ecologies. And that I believe that when you don't have your umbilical in the ground as a group of people, where your umbilical isn't rooting you in an intact way in the landscape as a group of people, where you don't know where all that sustains you comes from and you honor those things deeply, that when you, when you're, when you don't have that, that you're, you're in a place where, oh, gosh, how do I even put this? Hmm. Let me give that a moment of how to express what I'm thinking. Hmm. so great. <laughs> Such a great, I don't know, just to hear that and kind of be a treehouse observer. <laughs> it's nice too with the fire and everything. There's this, there, for me, there's this, um, that when you don't have cultural intactness to landscape, where your umbilical is not in the ground as an intact people who knows where all that sustains them comes from, that there's, there's this time it takes to do that that can't be done in a single generation. So that there are many of us who will never get to see our in our lifetimes, an intact culture to a landscape as a group of people where we're honoring all that sustains us. That it takes time. And a lot of older indigenous intact lands, uh, uh, cultures would say the same if they started a new village, that it would take generations for that village to be intact with place. I think that's actually a natural pattern of getting to know a place and also being in relationship with it in an honorable way. So for me, there's this, there's this part of planting cultural trees we'll never sit under the shade of, where we're, um, we're starting this process of helping to 
create the conditions for that seed of culture to actually sprout and grow and that it takes multiple generations for that plant to actually grow into a tree that's a fully expressive culture. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's a, you know, there's a, you know, there's of course a sadness I feel that I wasn't initiated with 30,000 village members pulling me up from the underworld, pulling me into a village where my ancestors, you know, where the people there knew 20 generations behind me of my ancestors. Like, I'm not going to have that. My daughter's not going to have it. My granddaughter's not going to have it. But what my hope is, is that if we all work toward it, that seven generations into the future, it will happen. And that there are beings that are, you know, these future generations that are speaking to us right now, asking us to cre start creating the conditions because they, if they're the ones that have to do it, then it's going to take seven generations beyond them. So they're calling out to us, I believe. And I believe our last, I call them my last happy ancestors, my last intact ancestors are working as well with me. And we're, we're doing the best we can with what we have to start to, to plant those seeds of culture right now. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how else to answer that. It's a, it's a big question. So many unknowns when you don't come from an intact culture. It's like, a, it's like with anything, if you don't have the patterns in you, sometimes it's hard even when they're right in front of you to even recognize them. You know, it's like sometimes you hear something when you're younger, but it's not until you're older that you understand what you heard because you have more the shape in you has changed to receive it or to, yeah, to recognize it. Um, I'm hoping that the work we're doing um, at Quell Springs, the work we're doing at our family farm, Casitas Valley Farm, Wilderness Awareness School, Circle Wise, all these communities that are doing work with nature awareness and permaculture and, uh, and grief rituals and all these other teachings that we're helping in our generations to start to set that that garden of culture in motion and starting to plant the rain for that garden to grow and plant the nutrients and make the compost and compa compost down this great grief that I believe our, we carry as modern people who who, who, who don't have a culture connected to place. And that great grief becomes the very nutrients that create the conditions for the seeds to actually grow for an authentic rooted culture. So the very thing that we grieve becomes the life-giving quality that feeds the next generations in a time beyond our own. Yeah. Hard to put it in words, but you could see it kind of, you know. It's a, nature doesn't throw anything away. She cycles it, and she has some incredibly ritualistic processes and ceremonies that she does to cycle, and, and composting is one of them, decomposition. And she brings in all sorts of different characters to help with that, a diversity of characters, you know, whether it's fungal or freezing and thawing and all these different processes so that nothing gets wasted and even if something you know the cougar kills the deer the baby deer and feeds its family that cougar someday will feed the baby deer of another generation by breaking down through that process of nature and then growing up as the grass and the forbs that feed that baby deer of another generation. So we're all through time feeding something for a time beyond our own. And so somehow the world seems more sane to me when I think of it like that, that 
Even our grief is not something we want to move, try to move around, but we want to metabolize it into something that can grow something new. That's life-giving and beautiful and graceful. And, yeah. What potential do you see in nature connection and tracking practices for creating healthy culture? Mm. I think I've touched on that mm. quite a bit. Um, I think the only thing I would say is that <laughs> tracking and nature connection are the training ground for pattern recognition skills. And pattern recognition skills are one of the most important skills needed for culture to actually thrive. Um, because we're living patterns within patterns within patterns. And so the more we can recognize them, the better we can work with those patterns to create not just healthy cultures, within people, but also the healthy culture of the ecologies that sustain us as well and sustain all the beings. So this, this uh, nature awareness tracking connection is really, to me, it's about a pattern awareness. And I just think it's interesting that permaculture is also about pattern awareness. And it's a, it's a tool for trackers. And, and To use the tool well, you need to also train in pattern recognition and pattern observation. So I, I, think that, I, I think I've already said that, but that's just one part that I think is really important is the pattern recognition piece. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, pattern language is in everything. Our, our language is a pattern, our, you know, Our growth cycles are patterns. The way grasses grow is in a pattern within a pattern within a pattern. And so um, it's, it's interesting how in history it's been the people with the most astute pattern recognition skills generally were the ones that became the leaders in their communities and that There's a pattern in innovation, which is very well documented. It's called the theory of the diffusion of innovation. And it uh, was hypostulated in 1962, I think from a professor from University of Ohio. I think it was Dr. Everett. And he talks about how innovation and the adoption of innovation or the diffusion of innovation through culture, through people, that There's about two to two and you know two percent, two and a half percent of the population are visionaries, that there's a vision. And to me, I see people who have astute pattern recognition skills are the ones that fi I find are the ones that go to the edge of systems and translate new energy into those systems through having a vision that other people don't see. And, and that vision to me is coming through pattern recognition of astute, subtle pattern recognition where you're just reading patterns far out into the world that other people don't see. And after that two and a half percent, there's what they say the seven to nine percent who are the early adopters. So there's people who are the ones that adopt what innovation might come through a vision, that innovation that comes, they'll be the early adopters. And that once you have that two to two and a half percent innovators and the seven to nine percent early adopters, that then the other 90 percent start to follow it. And that's, you can see, in ancient cultures as well as in how Apple computers has worked its marketing. I mean, it's like you can see it on all these different places, these diverse places. And you see that a lot of times it was those 
people who trained in pattern recognition, who had gifts in pattern recognition, who were the ones that were the innovators in their cultures. And so I'm just going to put that out there as this little gem because I, it's like we need innovation now. <laughs> and we need the early adopters who recognize that those patterns make sense. And with that, the other people will follow just because it feels right, maybe. And maybe they don't see the patterns, but it just feels right. Um, yeah. What does sacred mean to you and how can we reconnect to it? To me, sacred is the essence of what gives us life. It's thinking of the, like the, the cultures of Hawaii that had their, their sacred taboo forest high up on the mountain and, and that forest on the top of the volcano in Hawaii um, was the, like, the forest of the gods. It was a place that was sacred because from there all life came down scientifically as well. Like, like you had the cascading of life from this high volcanic forest that was in the, the rain cloud that would stay there and bring life into the mountain and, and bring it down to the rest of the world that was below it. And I think about that, that there's a lot of levels to that. And I think in the modern world, we've, we often, we often see sacred as separate from secular of what's life, day-to-day -day life. And then there's a sacred thing you go to on Sunday or you do something separate that's sacred. And yet there's sacredness happening all around us all the time. It's this life-giving quality that you can't touch, but you see its tracks. And you can feed it. And I guess that's how you touch it, is you feed it, you give to it. And in return, it gives you life, which is sacred. To me, it's just, maybe I've simplified it too much, but for me, that's, that's rather than simplifying it, I'm hoping that it's a bit of its essence. It's, and it can express itself in infinite ways. So, A ceremony a, that I would call sacred is one that's giving life. The ceremony is a part of giving life in some way, shape, or form. Might it might be for a person, it might be for what's seen or not seen, it might be for the ecology that sustains us, it might be for whatever it might be, but it's giving life, like at its essence, it's a life-giving It's that thing that gives life that we can't define. We can't see it with a, an atomic microscope. We can't like control it, but we can cord it. And, and we can feed it. And, and to me, that's where ceremonies that are truly sacred, sacred are doing that. They're courting the state, they're courting life and they're feeding life. And we have that inside of us. So there's that part of us that's sacred too, the life-giving quality of us. And even though it's inside of us, we can't really define it. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be defined to be fed. In fact, I almost think it's better that it's not. It's just honored. You know, you just honor it. And I feel like in today's day and age, because people don't, un 
we're taught in science that if we don't understand it or we can't define it, then it's not real. So now we have a modern society that looks at things that can't define as not real, and so a lot of the sacred is lost. And it's how she protects herself as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's often you, you find it in very subtle places. Generally, it's not so loud. Yeah. What is the role of storytelling in teaching? <laughs> what is the role of storytelling in teaching? What a question. Um, well, let me tell you a story now. Um, I believe we're hardwired for learning through stories, that we actually exist today as a species because of stories. Um, if you think about the practicality of being able to learn from the elders, people older than you, teaching you how to live in your landscape and how to live in your social scape, has always come through stories. You know, that's been a formidable part of how we mentor from generation to generation. And I believe our brain pathways are set up for stories as opposed to didactic education, where things are told to us, we memorize it and regurgitate it back. That's not the pattern from our ancestors. And we've evolved over, you know, it depends on who you talk to, over two million years, we've evolved with this sharing that's gone on around stories. And so for me, storytelling is right at the essence of a learning journey. That you can bring information to people, but information carried on the story gives relevance and actually helps to root the information in a way into the world around them that actually helps them to use that information for life-giving purpose. So it becomes the, it's kind of the story is the, the wagon that carries the information we need to live well. And living well might be humor and it might be, you know, it might be how you plant a certain seed or it might be how you look at, um, how you look at a, a sunset or how you, how you plan for, um, the rains that are coming to be able to grow food for your family, all of that is information that can ride a story into relevance into your life. And so stories to me, uh, it's like every culture has a creation story. Why is it a story? And you know, that's a question for you is why is there stories? that are in every single culture, every culture in the world use storytelling. So that tells you it's innately human. It's, it's, you, it's essential for us. You step out another layer and you look at this tree here. This tree also is telling stories. It can tell stories through the rings in its growth and every year it's telling stories if you're a, an, a an arborist or a plant physiologist, you can actually read the story of the landscape and this tree tells you the story of what's happened weather-wise through thousands of years or, you know, possibly hundreds of years or even a dozens of years, depending on how old the trees are. But everything's telling a story in its own way. And so I believe we actually live within a story. And mythologies are that. They're not metaphors. They're actually stories we live within. So if the story we live within is told and ritualized for life-giving purpose, it becomes a sacred myth. But the myth is alive because it's part of where you're at today. The myth doesn't end 10,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago. It's a part of today as well. So we know that with living mythologies that the story would end yesterday or last week 
And then when it's told a month from now, it would be move forward. Even though it might have started 100,000 years ago, it would still bring you to today. And that way you know the story's still alive. But we live within stories. Stories are patterns told. And it's, it's the weaving of patterns. So it's literally a weaving like a basket that becomes a container that carries the things that help you live and help you to even more than survive, but to live and to give life to a time beyond your own. Yeah. That's uh Something else with that. Um, I believe that how s we're hardwired to allow stories to come into both our brain and our heart. Oftentimes, our modern education is geared to just put things to our brain, but not our hearts. And stories have this gift of bridging what one of my elders says is the most difficult journey in life, which is only five hand spans apart, which is the journey from the head to the heart. And stories are one of those ways that I believe is a natural pattern to actually make that bridge. And in that way, it helps us to learn more holistically. And if we're trying to live holistically, we also need to create holistic learning. And it's, it's non-linear. And it's interesting that most of the world is non-linear. So it has its place in nature, as opposed to a didactic teaching, which is a linear one-way journey, generally. <laughs> 